So I welcome everybody to the first talk in this visit by Dr. Jigadachi Panaji. In case you don't know, she's a senior nun of the Sri Sharada Mat, which is the parallel women's wing to the men's order, the Ramakrishna order. Tonight, the topic for the talk is pitfalls in spiritual life. There'll be some time for question and answer and discussion after the talk. And we'll conclude with listening to a guided meditation by Revere Prabhujika and Jayapana Mataji. And then Anjan and Neeton invite you all to stay back for dinner. We have a donation plate there, which will help to fund this visit and future visits by both Gayatri Panaji and other nuns of the order. Also have a call tomorrow night on the fundamental reality of man. That's from 7 p.m. And that's in the Booker Pudge's residence in Boston Park. On Sunday at the Coons from 2.50 to 5 p.m. there'll be a retreat. The theme for the retreat is be you merely an instrument. And afternoon tea will be provided. This is going out live via Zoom, uh, where it's being recorded, and we'll put it up onto the Vedant Society of New South Wales YouTube channel later. I think without delay, I'm just going to continue to give a talk. I need a little bit of fine tuning here before we start. Is that all right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Just yeah. Oh, asato gamaya, tamaso ma jyotir gamaya, mrityor ma amritam gamaya. Om shanti shanti. Shantihi. Om, lead me from the unreal to the real. Lead me from darkness to light. Lead me from death to immortality. Om, peace, peace, peace. Ordinary people think that spiritual path is smooth, the journey is easy going. That's the ordinary idea of, of people. Oh, what? Go on spiritual path. What is it? What is the difficulty? Just sit for um, meditation for some time, morning, or maybe both morning and evening, and do some prayers. That's spiritual path. But somebody who is really earnest, want to make real progress in spiritual life, sees that it's not an easy one. It's a lot of obstacles are there, a lot of dangers are on the way. What do you mean by danger on the spiritual path? Well, if you travel, there'll be on the on the any path there'll be difficulties and the dangers will be there if you are not used to the path. If you are not prepared for the path. And it's the same with spiritual life also. The Kathapanar says, Uttishtada Jagrada Prapya Vara Nibodhata Shurasya Dhara Nishida Duratya Durgam Pathastat Kavayo Vadanti. Arise, awake, enlighten yourself by resorting to the great teachers. That's all fine. Then comes the warning. Like the sharp edge of a razor is that path. So say the sages. Difficult to tread and hard to cross. Spiritual path is not easy. We may think you know, it's so easy, but if you are really sincere and earnest in your spiritual pursuit, you find it's very difficult. In the beginning, you are starting or coming from um, busy life, 
with the uh, cutthroat competition of the uh, corporate world or working from the uh, in the business you sit for meditation your mind calms so so such so peaceful but after some you practice for some time and suddenly you find so difficult disturbing thoughts come up the mind your mind is so disturbed sitting for meditation you can't meditate you can't pray what is this i was much better off before i started you may think it's very very hard they say it's all on the path there is lot of dangers are there it's an uphill climb spiritual journey is an uphill climb like climbing the mount everest of spirituality so it's natural and true that the journey is very hard and <clears throat> path is very difficult to travel it's not for spiritual life is not for those people who want everything cozy comfortable no not that you had to uh, suffer yourself or torture yourself that's not spiritual life the idea often people have is oh we have to do extreme penances lot of austerities um, self mortification shri krishna says in the gita that's not uh, spiritual real spiritual life it is just mortifying the body harming the body and through that you are harming the self the atman the presence of god within so that's not uh, real spiritual life <coughs> but there are um, difficulties are there as jesus christ says in the bible straight is the gate and narrow is the way which lead unto life and few there be that find it it's difficult not many it's not for this uh, spiritual life is not for everybody not that there's a it's a um, privilege of a few people but everybody is not interested in the gita shri krishna says manushyanam sahasreshu kaschit etad siddhaye etadam api siddhanam kaschinmam veti tattvatah among thousands of people perhaps one may strive for the spiritual life on the spiritual path to go on the spiritual path and among thousands of such seekers perhaps one may attain it so that shows how difficult it is among thousands one may strive and, and among thousands of such seekers those who are striving for spiritual realization self realization perhaps one may attain but it's so difficult many fall on the way <clears throat> but once we know the difficulties and dangers then we can take necessary precautions and steps to meet those challenges that is why all these great teachers always say we should have some necessary qualifications to attain spiritual realization without them spiritual path is can be very dangerous just like if you want to climb mount everest so even to go up to the base camp or camp 1 you need a lot of lot of mountaineering practice if without any practice just go you will be um, suffering meeting with lot of dangers so you need practice and precautions some training basic training is needed <clears throat> and when we go follow the spiritual path we must be ready to bring about changes in our life and also ready to accept the changes that happen in our life that take sure to happen if you are following sincerely the spiritual path there will be changes happening within you you must be ready to accept them the in the beginning um <clears throat> you start on a spiritual path without doing any having um what to say proper training in the beginning and go on say suppose you are starting meditation you are going on doing meditation for long hours because you want to progress go forward quickly when 
when you do a lot of meditation, a lot of energy is released in the system. In the we even by concentration, a lot of energy is released in the system, in the body. But the nerves are not equipped to withstand that energy. It's like sending high voltage electricity through a weak electric wire. It will burst. It will burn up. Similarly, our body, mind, and nerves will not will be shattered if you practice too much of meditation right in the beginning. That's what people do. So there is some proper uh, preparation, training, and steps are to be taken carefully. So that's why they say meditation should be practiced um, slowly, gradually increase. You, When you start meditation for the first time, you have never meditated, you start for a short time. Meditate daily for a short time and gradually increase the time so that when you're concentrating, gradually the energy is released in the system, the nerves get used to that and slowly, slowly we increase. Just like doing any exercise. See, you are doing physical exercise. You have never done physical exercise. Suddenly you take um, vigorous exercise for for a long time, say a few, hour, a few hours from the beginning, then what happens? The body reacts, very adversely reacts. So what, gradually increase the time, the body is fine, it adjusts to it. The same with meditation, gradually, gradually, you increase the time, you can increase the time to 10, 12 hours a day, nothing will happen, but it has to be gradual. Otherwise, there'll be a lot of difficulties. There is <clears throat> that, that are what we call the pitfalls on the spiritual path. Another pro problem is, or what happens often is, we mistake intellectual, intellectual knowledge with spiritual wisdom. I have read a lot of books. I studied a lot of scriptures. I know everything intellectually, but I think that I have progressed on the spiritual path. You've got intellectual knowledge. It hasn't become your own. It hasn't become your wisdom. Because intellectually you know everything. But has it become part and parcel of you? Are you practicing it in your everyday life? If you are practicing in, in your daily life, then you can say it has become part of you. Otherwise it is just intellectual knowledge. The, the philosophy professors may know everything about the you know, philosophy or Sanskrit. Professors will know all the scriptures. The Upanishads, the, the, the Vedanta, they, all, they will know all that. But are they self-realized people? They know intellectually. They haven't practiced in their daily life. So there's a big difference between intellectual knowledge and spiritual wisdom. And often people... After studying, they think they are, I got all the wisdom. Now I can teach others. I can guide others, not just teaching. Teaching is giving, imparting intellectual wisdom, uh, intellectual knowledge, but they think that they can guide others on a spiritual path because you know everything. We have read in the books, we have listened to lectures, we know everything. In order to advance on the path, you have to overcome the ego. The moment you think that I have progressed, now I am ready to guide others on the spiritual path, that I, ego, that's a big obstacle. Until you are able to overcome that ego, you are not actually um, advanced on the spiritual path. <clears throat> and that takes a lot of time. It's not, not the... Um, matter of just a few months or years. It may take a lifetime to overcome the ego. The years ago I read a, an article one of by one of the monks of the Ramkrishna order. He is an American. So he says he's talking about the um, training that the Ramakrishna order gives for, for the monks and us. We have to have um, 
we have at least 10 years training before we get the final vows and the monastic um, robes. He says, often, they're talking about the Americans, they go to India, stay in some ashram for six months and graduate as a Swami and come back and set up an ashrama and become a guru. So it's so easy. It's so easy to become a, a, a teacher. You have to re reduce uh, your ego. You have, you've got intellectual knowledge. You've studied the scriptures. But that does not make you a spiritual master. It takes time. <clears throat> Thinking that I'm ready to guide others on the spiritual path is like, like the blind leading the blind. The Upanishad says, it's like the blind leading the blind. What happens? Both will fall in the ditch. Milarepa, the Buddhist um, saying says, do not pose as a teacher of others while you remain ignorant, ignorant of the truth yourself. You are ignorant of the truth yourself and you are posing as a teacher. False teachers harm themselves as well as those they instruct. So that's what the blind leading the blind, both fall in the ditch. <clears throat> Another danger we have is confusing momentary experience with spiritual or realization or self-realization. You have got some momentary experience, especially those who are very emotional or coming from the world which is full of problems, difficulties, competitive world, full of stress, person experience, peace, and serenity, or even may have some glimpse of the reality in the company of a holy person. And the person, well, if you think that person, has the, the person, he or she thinks, oh, I have realized, then start boasting about it. It will be foolish. Um, years ago, um, Swami Ranganathanta Maharaj used to come to Australia and conduct uh, retreats. In, in Sydney, he used to have one week retreat, sometimes 10 days. It is all um, in the early 70s and 80s. And one, one of the um, ladies who attended the retreat one day told uh, Swami Ajay Pranamadaji, yesterday Swami raised our consciousness and we all had a glimpse of the, of the truth, reality. Well, everybody felt that day it was extremely um, wonderful. And I think Robert also was present at the, at the retreat. They, I heard from many people who attended the retreat that they all felt it's something special. But to say that we had a glimpse of the reality. We had self-realization. It's not self-realization, it's a glimpse of the reality. Because of uh, Swami's spirituality, they were, he was able to raise their mind. But that's not self-realization. For that, you have to work yourself. But you get the, the teacher can maybe the holy person, the presence can give you a glimpse but that's not self-realization. That for that you have to work hard yourself. And another one is outward symptoms are often taken as the sign of great spiritual fervor. Emotional states um, during devotional singing. It often often happens. Devotional singing, group singing, the emotions are raised. People start shedding tears, and they're thinking, oh, this is tears of ecstasy. These emotions are raised, but that is not a sign of real spiritual realization. You have raised on the wings of those emotions, but there is no support. So what happens after some time? The emotions subside and you fall down. 
just as you are lifted up the same way, without any support, you fall down. So Medhi Siddhanta says, out of out of a hundred aspirants, eighty may become charlatans, fifteen may go insane, and only the remaining five may be blessed with a vision of the real truth. See, say hundred people are striving, eighty think that that majority, more eighty percent think that oh, we have attained a realization and then started um, teaching others. And 15 of them, they do overdo the things quickly and may go insane. That's why meditation has to be, as I said earlier, had to practice slowly, go gradually. Overdo it, the nervous, your nervous breakdown or even may go insane. And the remaining five may be blessed with the real realization. There is one incident in the in you read in the life of Swami in Brahmananda. Whenever Swami was, he was the disciple of Sri Ram, the one of the what's a prominent disciples of Sri Ramakrishna. Uh, we say he is the spiritual son of Sri Ramakrishna. He was the first president of the Ramakrishna order. Whenever he was in Belumat, he made that all of the all the monks should meditate in the morning in his room or in the in the shrine. And he noticed that one young novice, one young brahmachari was not coming. And after the meditation, all will assemble in Swami's room. There'll be question and answer. He'll be giving advice. And then there'll be devotional singing going on for quite some time. So he noticed that one person, one young man is not coming. So after a few days, he asked him why he is not why you are not coming for the um, group um, discussion and um, chant, medita singing he said so many time so much of time is wasted because you go on taking telling jokes and other things i don't want to waste time so continue with the meditation but so maharaj said swami said you know you come and have sit in here and attend meditate here in this room with uh, with others and afterwards attend the devotional singing discussion. But he refused. He wanted to spend more time on meditation. But after a few months, he became mad, insane. Maharaj knew that this uh, he is doing overdoing. That's why he was cautioning. But unfortunately, the young man didn't listen to. So that's why Swami says, Swami he says, 15 may become insane. Only five may become blessed with the vision of real truth. <clears throat> they, often people think at any cost, I must have the realization or spiritual experience. And sometimes when you are struggling for spiritual experience so much, you may try to imitate. And uh, that also we can see when Sri Ramakrishna was ill towards the end of his life, he was in Kosipur Garden House. And there will be devotional singing going on. Narendra and others will be singing. And some will be in ecstasy. Sri Ramakrishna often goes into trance, samadhi. Some of the uh, disciples or uh, devotees Notice, um, Narendra noticed some of these devotees, uh, whenever the singing going on, they go into trance, some of them shedding tears, some laughing, all in ecstasy. So Narendra got doubtful. How can this be? So many people have suddenly become so full of um, ecstasy and trances. He found some of them are practice, practicing at home, <laughs> inducing, practicing. So <laughs> they think that they... they they are really going forward. No, it's it's deluding yourself that you are on the spiritual path. These are all dangers for us. When uh, when some of the young disciples, other young young men who later became monks, were 
shedding tears, Narendra took them to task. See, you, you see those people? They are practicing at home. You are doing the same thing. No, stop that. <laughs> we, when we through practice of japa and meditation, the mind becomes sharp and very keen and concentrated. Then we can discover the hidden defects of our mind. If you do a self-examination, your mind becomes so subtle and sharp that you can um, find out what are the defects or what are the um, shortcomings of my mind. At the same time, it can also look at the faults of others. Little, little faults in others, you, you enlarge it. And what happens, you were gone seeing the faults in others, you accumulate those faults. That's why Holy Mother says, don't look at the faults of others. Rather, look at your own fault. Look at your own fault and try to correct it. But when the mind becomes sharp and is uh, keen, we see the faults of others. You look at the faults of others. Instead of searching your own mind and trying to correct your faults, you look at the faults of others. And concentrating on that, you are absorbing those faults in your, in your own life. <clears throat> because the mind is like, as Sri Ramakrishna says, the cloth that has come from the laundry, clean, white cloth, very clean. In whichever color you dip, it takes that color. So if you are looking at the faults of others, the mind takes that color. And our mind become more and more polluted, more become dirty. So that has to be, we have to be careful. Because mind becomes clear, you have to be careful how much faults of others you are going to look. And another thing is, we often think that we are following a religious life or spiritual life, but often it is more for a, it's a fashion. I listen to um, such and such um, Swamis or uh, that uh, religious person's talks. I read, I study such and such books. We want to, we want to boast, we want to tell everybody, show off how um, religious I am, how spiritual I am. Uh, Swami Edishiranda says it's a, um, following a very fashionable religious life. It's not, um, in Swami Edishiranda was in Bangalore, and he used to say it's a fashion of those Bangalore people at that time to go to Ramakrishnashram. It's very fashionable. Where are you going? Oh, I'm, I'm going to Ramakrishnashram to attend the talks. It's very fashionable. You are, the, you are leading a fashionable life. It's not a spiritual life. And it happens with people, many people, where they think that they are leading a spiritual life, but it is not. Because often we follow this um, religious life, not for the love of God or enlightenment, but having a better worldly life. Get a better job. I go to, I pray, go to the temple, pray to God. What for? What are we praying for? Oh, I should get a promotion. I should have good marks in the examination if you are a student. In this evening, we are discussing how the temple is full of students. So many students come. What are they praying for? To get better, better results in the examination. How many of the people go to the temple? How many of them pray to God? To love God, to have God. I realize God. They pray for everything else. To get a good job, be free from disease, be healthy, health, wealth, progeny, all. But nobody says, 
God, I want to, I want to love you. I want to realize you. How many people pray for that? <clears throat> that is why the Spanish mystic Juan de Avila says, how many think they love him who only love themselves? How many think they seek him while they only seek themselves? How many do we call spiritual who are purely carnal? They are extremely worldly, but they think, and we also call them spiritual. <laughs> but Sri Krishna says, even such people are noble. In the Bhagavad Gita, in the seventh chapter, Gita, Sri Krishna says, four type of people pray to me. Those who are in distress, those who are seeking wealth, those who are seeking knowledge and the wise. We will, how can we say that those who are in distress and those who are seeking wealth are praying to God, are praying, praying to God, but he says all these are noble. Even those whom, who are praying to God for wealth or because they are in distress say, sick problem, family problem, job problem, they're praying to God. Sri Krishna says they are all noble. They are high souls because they are praying to God. What the, his idea is, gradually the mind will become purer and purer and will turn to God for God's sake. At present, the mind is that we are praying to God only for all these things, but gradually in the long run, it takes a long time. In the long run, it will pray to it will turn to God for his own sake. That is why often, if you look at the Sanskrit hymns that we have, towards the end there is one verse which says the Bhalashruti, the result. Result of this chanting this particular hymn. You chant this hymn every day. The, the, the verse will say, you will get um, long life, health, wealth, progeny, long life. And then they will say, and finally, liberation, salvation. Because first you, you want all these things. All right, you'll get all these things. But gradually, the mind becomes pure and turn to God for his own sake, God's sake. But that is towards the end. Ma'am, all the great teachers tell us that it is, it is dangerous actually to practice concentration without having a minimum purity, purity of mind. Why is the purity of mind so much stressed in spiritual life? Why can't we just live as we want and go do spiritual practices? They, they say it's dangerous because when the mind is concentrated and you are meditating, as I said earlier, a lot of energy is released in the system. And if the mind is not pure, if the energy is not channeled in the right way, it will end up in the wrong way. The energy has to go somewhere. It will go on the wrong, wrong path and you will be end up in disaster. <clears throat> it will destroy the body and the mind. It eventually, will be destroyed, the person himself will be destroyed if it is not properly directed. May come and uh, they will have many spiritual, uh, psychic, um, psychic powers will come. And when you meditate, a lot of psychic and energies release and psychic powers come to the person. And the mind will play all types of tricks. We have to be very, very careful about our mind. It will play tricks on us. The mind will say, you know, I have progressed far. Or another day, mind will say, today I'm not well. I can't meditate. 
maybe one day or few days, it could be really true. The body is too weak, tired, sick. But then the mind will grab on that and say, oh, today I'm not feeling like meditating. Let me, I'll do tomorrow. The, the, the next day, oh, not today, tomorrow. You will never know how fast the mind will go down, tricking you. So mind will play a lot of tricks. So you'll be always on our guard. Only after getting some introspective power can we correctly evaluate where our mind is. The mind through meditation may go forward or get stuck where we are, where it is. Only if you have, if you have um, real introspective power, power of introspection, analysis, self-analysis, we have to have regular a thorough self-analysis. Have I am I doing the right thing? Am I progressing? Or am I my ego is increasing? Selfless, pitiless self-analysis you have to do. We are ready to analyze others and other people's behavior, but not our own behavior. Anything, let's just as I said earlier, any mistake in others, we are ready to find out, criticize, but not at ours. Our own mistakes we gloss over, we'll find out what, um, so find out excuses for that. So we have to be very careful with how our mind is playing the tricks. And there is no, another thing I have to remember, there is no shortcut in spiritual life. It's not that you do for a few days and then immediately you will self-realization. No, there's no shortcut. It's no instant realization. If anybody say you can have self-realization in a few days, it's not for ordinary ordinary people like us. If you have done a lot of practices in spirit, in a, maybe in the previous life you have done, then it may happen. But for majority of people, then there is no instant self-realization. It has to be hard, it, hard work, long practice. <clears throat> and before practice, we have to have minimum moral practices. Moral purity has to be there. In the often we can see people at, um, practice the follow the Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, Ashtanga Yoga, eight limbs of yoga. Everybody is so much fascinated by the pranayama and how Patanjali explains everything. They go for from asana, pranayama, dharana, dhyana, samadhi. They all go forward. The first two steps, yama and niyama. Nobody is very keen to practice. But they are the moral basis. Without that basis, you go on. You are building a big house, a multi-story building without proper foundation. It will soon collapse. Yama and Yama, the do's and don'ts, they are the basic of spiritual life. Without that, there can be no spiritual life. But people who say that they are advanced in spiritual life and lead an immoral life, even if they claim that they have realized God, they had vision of God, now you can never trust them because it's not, not possible. They may have had some glimpse, but they won't stay there for long. They'll fall down because there's no foundation. Do's and don'ts, the moral life, the ethical moral life is the foundation of spiritual life. <laughs> and purity of mind and a strong character comes from this leading an ethical and moral life. So Swami Vivekananda says, what you want is character. Character is very, very important. Character, strengthening of the will. Continue to exercise your will and it will take you higher. The will is almighty. It is character that can cleave through adamantine walls of difficulties. Character is very, very important. Because that is the basis of spiritual life. <clears throat> and Swami Brahmananda says, the real 
test of spiritual progress is character, de character development. If you have progressed in spiritual life, then you, are, you will have a very noble character. Anybody coming to your presence can feel that you are a noble person. That's the test of um, spiritual progress. <clears throat> so this mental purity and spiritual realization proceed should be uh, undertaken gradually, go step by step. If somebody is taken to the heights of spiritual illumination, it can be so confusing the person. And but no trouble, there won't be any problem like that if the person has gradually progressed. You know the story how Narendra, when he came, Swami Vivekananda later, Narendra came to Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna touched him, just touched him. And Narendra saw that the whole room was going to disappear and himself going to disappear. He, his individuality is disappearing. He thought he was going to die. So he screamed, what are you doing? I got my father, I got my mother at home. Sri Ramakrishna touched him and he became normal. And after a few years, you can see in Kosipu Garden House, he and attained a state of Nirvikalpa Samadhi. And then he wanted to remain in that state. To the same high state. First, earliest, he was frightened. He was confused. What is this? What are you doing? But the same state he had, he through practice, through his, his, his effort, he attained that state and he wanted to remain in that state. Sri Ramakrishna said, no, you have got work to do. After, once you finish your work, then you can go back to that state, not, not now. <clears throat> there is another incident you can see. Um, before the, all these disciples came, Sri Ramakrishna had his nephew, Hrde, with him, looking after him for many years. In the early days, uh, from the time Sri Ramakrishna came to uh, or started work in the Kali temple, Hrde, his nephew, was his constant companion. And Hrde often uh, asked Sri Ramakrishna to have, help him have visions or some extra, some spiritual experience. Sri Ramakrishna kept on saying, there is no need for you to have spiritual experiences. You are looking after me. That's enough. No, but Hirde was not happy. He wanted to have some experience. One day, Hirde and, um, he was following Sri Ramakrishna, going somewhere. Suddenly, suddenly, he saw that Sri Ramakrishna's body was luminous. Light is emanating from the body. All of the, it was at night, dark night. So the whole place was lit, lit by the light coming from, emanating from Sri Ramakrishna's body. And suddenly he saw that his body is, also, is luminous. The light is coming from his body also. He started shouting, Sri Ramakrishna, Ramakrishna, we are not ordinary people. We are divine. Let's go and save everybody. Let's help people. And Sri Ramakrishna said, keep quiet. You are having little, this tiny bit, little bit of experience, spiritual experience, you are making such a big noise. I'm having so much every day. Then he touched through there and he became brought back to normal life. Normal. He see, came back dumb, thumb. With a, with a thumb, he came down to the normal plane because he didn't practice spiritual disciplines. And <clears throat> without that, you cannot go. If, through the grace of a holy person, if you raise yourself up, you won't be able to remain there. Just like the case of Narendra. Narendra got frightened, confused. Then Narendra also saying he couldn't understand, he couldn't stay there, and Sri Ramakrishna had to bring down. <laughs> Again, seeing these trances of these mm, devotees, different devotees, Narendra asked Sri Ramakrishna, why they are all having so much of ecstasies and trances? Then Sri Ramakrishna said, see, in a small pool of water, if an elephant 
gets into that, will be the way the splash. There will be water will be splashed everywhere. Big upheaval of water. But if in a big reservoir, an elephant and there's nothing happens. Nothing is seen. These are small receptacles. Some spiritual emotion comes. There's a big show. But a really um, spiritual re um, person with a real spiritual realization is a, like a huge reservoir. Nothing is shown. So don't worry. They are all shallow ponds. So that's why so much of commotion. He explained to Narendra. <clears throat> we call about this, said about the psychic uh, powers when you meditation, through meditation, psychic powers comes. But they are a great, great obstacle, danger on a spiritual path. <clears throat> there are many a seeker has gone under this danger of the psychic powers. Patanjali says that anybody, anybody practicing meditation will get these psychic powers. If you are sincere in your practice of meditation, you will get some psychic powers. And he lists about some 36 different powers in the Yoga Sutras. But they are all obstacles. In, in the end, after listing all these 36 one, he says, they are obstacles on the spiritual path. You won't, Sri Ramakrishna said, even one, if you have, you won't make any progress in spiritual life. When Narendra was practicing meditation, after um, some time, he developed the power of clairvoyance and clairaudience. He could see something happening at a distance, far away. Or he could hear um, people talking far away. So he, as they always did, he reported um, the, to Sri Ramakrishna. Because whatever, however their meditation, whatever happening, they always reported to Sri Ramakrishna. And Sri Ramakrishna made the uh, corrections, arrangement, uh, whatever to be done. He gave his um, teachings or instructions. So when Narendra said, reported this, Sri Ramakrishna asked him to stop meditation for a few days. Because any of this, you um, practice, use these powers, it will be a great obstacle. It will be, um, it, you can't make any further progress in spiritual path. It will be, you will be taken away from the spiritual path, these powers. <clears throat> And another time, Sri Ramakrishna told Narendra, I have got these uh, powers and I would like to hand it over to you. Because he could give spirituality just like giving something concrete. Narendra said, will that help me in self-realization? To realize the Atman, to realize God? No, it won't help you in self-realization, but it will help you in doing a lot of work, a lot of great things. Narendra said, first let me realize the Atman or realize God, then I'll see whether I need his powers. Sri Ramakrishna must have been testing Narendra how, how much he is interested in his powers. <clears throat> there are the... One of the teachers of Sri Ramakrishna was Bhairavi Brahmani. She's, when she came to Sri Ramakrishna, she said that in a vision, she was shown that she had to teach three, three, three disciples to get, she has to guide in his, on the spiritual path. Two of them she had already seen, she had given them guidance. And third one was Sri Ramakrishna. So those, those two, uh, I'd say, brother disciples of Sri Ramakrishna, because they are uh, disciples of the same guru. One by name Chandra, he had developed this power of becoming invisible, one of the psychic powers. So he could go to 
place from place to place without being anybody will nobody will see him. He can be here in the midst of all of us, nobody will see him. But what happened afterwards? He developed egotism and attachment to, to lust, got involved with some young lady and had a fall. <clears throat> and humiliation. Another person, another disciple was by name is Girija. He could bring light from the from his back. He came to, to Dakshinesha Kali temple to see Sri Ramakrishna. One day both of them had gone to the neighboring garden house and talked, they walked on the garden for a long time. By the time they were coming back, it was dark. And there was no electric light at that time, there's nothing. So dark that Sri Ramakrishna was stumbling on the path. Oh, though he knew the path, still he was stumbling. So this other person said, Girija said, brother, wait. And he turned back and a beam of light came from his back and lighted the path all the way to the gate of the, the Kali temple. And Sri Ramakrishna could easily walk with the light. No problem. But Sri Ramakrishna says, before they left, um, both both of them come to Sri, Ram, to Sri Ramakrishna to see him. Before they left the Asia, they both of them lost that power. Because they were sincere aspirants. They developed this power and they were going, going astray, out of the path, straying away from the spiritual path. But divine, because they were sincere, Divine Mother uh, took away the power. And <clears throat> says, thus help them on the spiritual path. We think that developing these powers are sign of progress. No, they are obstacles. When um, Mother took away, Divine Mother, God removed those, um, spirit, uh, those powers, then they could progress on the path again. <clears throat> so that is why we say concentration without Non-attachment. Without non-attachment, if you are concentrating, you cannot progress on the spiritual path. Because whatever we are attached to, whatever we are thinking about at the mind, at the time of concentration, you will get that. You are concentrating on something. With some desire, you are making concentration. You are concentrating with some particular desire. You're praying to God with some particular desire. You get that. You are praying to God with, um, say, you want to uh, develop some power. You get that. But you won't be progressing on a spiritual path. Not just in this life. Maybe in future life also you'll get those results. But what are we usually concentrating on? Desire for power, pleasure, we get them. <clears throat> and Patanjali says that these powers that we get, the results that we come get, not just in this life, in the in the in the um, future life also, may take you a state of disincarnate God or become one with the force of nature. Like uh, we have in the Hinduism, we have got these um, different deities who are in charge of the forces of nature. Like there's a wind god, uh, rain god, fire god, all these deities in charge of different um, powers of nature. You, you may become one of those. That is, you had done a lot of meritorious deeds, prayer and meditation, but with desire. So you get those results. Those results will become. Sri Krishna says, those who pray to God with those desires, they get that to go to this higher level, plane of existence, realms of existence, and enjoy the pleasures there. But once those merits are over, they have to come back to earth. 
when the merit, merits are exhausted, they come back to earth. Because earth is the, the world is the karma bhumi, field of action. Gods in heaven, they cannot make any spiritual progress. They have to come to earth as human beings to make spiritual progress. Only on the, on the human body can we make any progress in spiritual life. <clears throat> so, you go to heaven, come back. May, may do again meritorious deeds. Go to heaven again, again come back. This goes on and on and on. That's called this process of going round and round the wheel of birth and death or samsara. They are not seeking liberation. They are the, because they are practicing austerities, meditation with desire. They don't get freedom. Unless you are, till you become free from desires, there can be no freedom. They have become the fallen yogis. And we can see in the Yoga Sutras, Patanjali gives a warning to advanced seekers about being tempted by the fallen yogis. See, somebody I was practicing all these spiritual disciplines, meditation, etc., with great concentration, but with some desire lurk, lurking in the mind. So, stayed straight away from the spiritual path and uh, becomes fallen from the spiritual path. So, becomes a fallen yogi. <clears throat> What happens then? That yogi may try to tempt others who are on the spiritual path, seeking real seekers. They may try to pull them down. I have fallen down. Why is that person going up? Let me pull that person down. So try to tempt that person, the spiritual seeker, and try to uh, take the person away from the spiritual path. So that is one of the dangers of the on the spiritual path. So you think that, see, how many types of dangers are there? You think it's so easy. If you sincerely go forward, there are so many dangers. This is one of the great dangers. <clears throat> they use those psychic powers and then strayed away from the spiritual path, fell from the path, became fallen yogis. And now they are jealous of others who are progressing. And they try to tempt them and bring them down. Drag them down. And the temptation increases as you progress on the path. In the early days, there's no problem. We are just starting on a spiritual path. You have, everything is smooth. Path is smooth. But as you progress, the mind becomes subtler. The senses become keener, and then the problem starts. <clears throat> For the beginner, there's no, there is no problem. Only problem will be maybe just sitting. Your body may not even like to sit for half an hour, restless. But all these deeper problems, the dangers of the spiritual path, not for the beginner. But after advancing some days along the path comes these problems. Personality, the, as the, uh, you go on meditating, you, your appearance, you, your physical appearance changes. Your personality becomes so attractive. People are attracted to you. Your voice becomes what's a, more, more melodious. So all these things attract people. And the person is um, able to exert psychological power on others. And then senses grow keener. And the senses become more capable of enjoyment. So these are all dangers. So what happens? The more easy for the person to get involved in power, to exert psychological power on others, to control them, or get into um, sex relationship with others, all these dangers come 
as you go along the path, progress on the path, go forward on the path, not on the beginner. Beginner, there's no problem. But as you progress, you find all these problems coming up. And the person may completely forget the spiritual goal for some time. So what happened to such a yogi who has fallen from the spiritual path? Shri Arjuna asked this question to Shri Krishna. What happens to the yogi? Has he's lost both the world enjoyments and spiritual realization, self-realization, both gone? Does he so Arjuna asked, does he lose both this world and the rest and the next world? Shri Krishna gives hope and he gives reassurance. He says, nothing is lost. One who walks on the path of virtue never goes to ruin. Shikshna says, Nahi kalyanakrit kaschit durgadim tata gachati. He will, the person who is on the spiritual path never goes to ruin. For this time, he stray, the person strays away from the path, but will come back. The next life, the spiritual realization Reaching the goal is delayed. That's all. But nothing is completely lost. In the next life, again, start from where he has strayed away from stopped. He'll go forward, only delayed. <clears throat> and the next, next life will be in a more favorable situation and start again. But if you don't want to delay, we have to be careful. These are dangers on the path. Because these psychic powers or occult powers are still in the realm of matter. Speaking about this use of occult powers and working of the miracles, we, we all want, we say, we think that uh, doing miracles is a sign of spiritual progress. But they say it's all, it's all matter. It's all the, the, in the realm of matter. So about this uh, doing miracles or showing the powers, Swami Vivekananda says, matter does not prove spirit. What connection is there between the existence of God, soul or immortality and the working of miracles? Doing some miracles and ex uh, God and or the soul, what's the connection between them? There's nothing. Doing, doing, doing miracles is the, in the realm of matter, the world. <clears throat> but we know that great teachers like uh, Moses, Jesus, they all did miracles. But we have to understand the surroundings and times when they did all these things. The people could not understand anything higher than, greater than that. The teachings there were only a few could understand. But miracles, they had to show these miracles to impress the common. So Swamiji says, <clears throat> what, talking about Jesus doing the miracles, he says, they were, vul they were vulgar things that, that he could not help doing, just doing those miracles a vulgar things he could not help doing because he was among vulgar be beings. This, those people were not spiritually evolved. They could only understand curing um, diseases or um, helping the blind see, um, curing the heal the sick. All those type of miracles only they could understand. If you read the Quran, you can see, I haven't read the Quran as it is, but I read the uh, 365 readings from Islam. It say, it often it says, the people tell Muhammad, if you are an apostle, let's see, why don't you um, make the um, mountain move or river flow this way? They want miracles. Other than I, with the teachings that, he gave. They don't want to follow that. They don't understand. 
the miracles only they understand. <clears throat> so the same with Jesus. So he you can see Jesus after showing all these miracles, he's he is admonishing the Jews for asking for signs. These are signs. Mir they want signs. You can see Buddha, one of his monks, uh, did a miracle when he was um, having a discussion with um, a, a monk from another of the follower of another teacher and to show the greatness of Buddha, this Buddha's monk did a miracle. He threw up his begging bowl and said if Buddha's teachings are great, the begging bowl will stand up, up in the sky. He threw it up and it remained. When Buddha heard that, somebody else came and reported to Buddha, he took this monk to task because doing miracles is not the sign of spirituality. The, many of the miracles the magicians do, we don't call them um, a spiritually progressed person because miracles are not sign of spirituality. It's sign of some power, that's all, occult power. <clears throat> The main characteristic of true spirituality is the spirit of non-attachment towards worldly attainments. Worldly gains, power. If you are not, not attached to them, that's a sign of spirituality. If you are completely um, selfless, that's a, a sign of spirituality. Often people think, I think that if you only if you sit and meditate and or pray, you are a spiritual person. No, you are unselfish. Come, come caring for others. That's a sign of spirituality. <clears throat> In order to avoid falling into these pitfalls, avoid these dangers, first of all, we have to get well grounded in the moral practices. As I said earlier, there's no shortcut. The yama and niyama, the do's and don'ts of spiritual practices are very, very important. Now, what are these yama? What are the things that we have to do and what are the things that we have to avoid? First, Padanjali says, gives the five yamas, the things that you have to avoid. They are um, um, Practice of ahimsa, that is non-violence, not taking any life, destroying. Non-violence, often we think that it is non-killing. No, it's not just that. Hurting any being in any way. Hurting any being in any way is violence. It's ahimsa, not just killing. You use harsh word to a person and hurt the person, you are doing himsa to that person. So, ahimsa, non-violence, is not hurting anybody through thought, word, or deed. Even thinking about hurting thoughts about another person, you are violent. You are doing himsa. Then speaking the truth, holding on to truth, avoiding anything, any untruth. Truth can be two ways, speaking the truth and keep keeping up the word that you have given. Both two types of truth uh, there. Then non-stealing. We are not thieves. We don't go around stealing things. But you say non-stealing? Well, you, as a group, you did a project. And when it is successful, you take all the claim. You are actually stealing. You didn't do everything. You do, do, took the help of others also. Then more, um, how can you claim that whole project as your, your success as yours? You know, most of the things that we do, we, we don't do everything from the scratch, from the, uh, from the bottom. We, we build on what is already, say you are doing a research. We are building on uh, doing from what what's knowledge is already there. 
So somebody has put in the effort earlier, we are building on that work of other person. And you cannot take the credit, you have to acknowledge the other person's contribution. If when you take credit all for yourself, without giving credit to others, you are actually stealing. All, see so much subtle things comes in when you pra really pra you have to practice yama and niyama. And if you want to go on the spiritual path, you have to follow it in all these ways. <clears throat> Then there is Aparikirha non uh, receiving of gifts. Well, we get gifts left and right. Well, well, you can accept gifts if it is given with real love. Or as far as possible, don't accept any gifts that comes with strings. Then that cat can pull you down. So they had to be careful. And what are the things to be practiced? Purity, contentment, um, austerities. When you say austerity, don't think that it is um, self mortification. That's not austerity. Austerity, in the Gita says there are three types three type of austerities of body, speech, and mind. Speech is, body is keeping it body uh, pure, uh, clean and pure or as far as possible, calm. Speech, speak the truth, not harming others. And mind, being settled. A calm, serene mind. Then study of scriptures, self-study, and surrender to God. These are the things that you had to practice. And ahimsa and those yama and niyama. Some things to do, some things to avoid. Unless these two, they are established in this. They are the foundation of spiritual life. You cannot build a spiritual life. So we had to not that you have to fully establish before you start meditating. No. You practice this and along with that, along with your meditation, you go on practicing in your daily life. These are the daily dealing with others. These two, yama and niyama, you have to practice. Not just uh, as a spiritual discipline. In your daily life, you have to practice in the world. Then your mind becomes pure. and you will be able to make progress. <clears throat> we, we, in the day, in our day-to-day -day life, we are constantly fighting between our good habits and bad habits. We all have got some good qualities, some good habits, some bad habits, and we have to take the side of the good ones and join forces with um, the instructions of our teachers or guides, holy people, and fight the bad habits. We have to do that. Nobody else can do that for us. No uh, uh, teacher or spiritual person, no guide, no guru can do that. They can give you instructions. They can give you guidance do this but the walk do the doing that you do you do you, yourself see you are sick the doctor prescribes medicine you have to take the medicine whether you like it or not maybe a very bitter pill i don't i don't like the taste of the medicine i'm not going to take that medicine you can take the medicine and you tell the doctor it's not going to cure you you have to do the hard work you have to take the bitter pill. So the work has to be done. We have to do the work ourselves. <clears throat> and one way to do help to cultivate the good habits is fill the 
brain and mind with high elevating ideas and thoughts. We always, from the external world, we get all the different good and bad impressions. When bad impressions come, bad thoughts come, how are we to get rid of them? Bring in good ones, good thoughts, elevating thoughts. The, now everything is there at the tip of your uh, finger, fingertips, literally. When earlier, when we say fingertip, it's all not literally, literally you cannot take. Now it's all fingertips. So tap tested, phony, and you get everything. All the high ideals, great ideas are there. It's for us to take in. <clears throat> and then these negative thoughts will be pushed out. Sri Ramakrishna says, when uh, you, your uh, thorn is gone into your foot, you take another thorn, take it out. But you don't take the keep the second thorn with you because it was it was useful. Now you throw both out. So in the in the similar in a similarly, you remove the bad thoughts, negative thoughts, by bringing in good thoughts, positive thoughts. But then you have to give that up also if you want to go further, because that also can hold you back. No, you have to go forward. Beyond good and bad. Beyond likes and dislikes. So in the Vedanta, they call them, you go beyond the pair of opposites. You go beyond the pair of opposites when you reach the state of perfect contentment, perfect happiness. <clears throat> but in the beginning, we have to be extremely alert and watchful. The, because it can, the negative thoughts can, ideas can come as, as it's just a passing thought. We think it's just a passing thought. I didn't, I didn't mean it or I didn't pay any attention. It's just a passing thought. No, it has left an impression. That thought comes again the impression becomes deeper. First, it's just a small line. Then that, that line becomes deeper and then deeper. And before you know, it has become very strong impression. So imitation of Christ says, we must be watchful, especially in the beginning of temptation, because then the enemy is more easily overcome. In the beginning, if you are alert, as soon as that Negative thought comes. We can catch yourself. This is not good for me. If you are alert and watchful, you can catch and uh, get rid of it. So that's why he says, we must be watchful, especially in the beginning of temptation, because then the, then the enemy is more easily overcome. If he is not suffered to come in at all at the door of the mind, and is kept out and resisted at his first knock. As the temptation, the bad impressions come, if you're alert, you will be able to catch hold before the temptation becomes strong. The Gita Shri Krishna says, first, it is just a passing idea, just an impression. I saw something, then I see that again and again, get attached, attached to it, a desire comes, attachment comes, then from attachment, if that attachment, that desire is obstructed, turns to anger, then my mind is clouded, I'm not able to think properly, intellect is disturbed, and at last it leads to ruin of the person. All starts with it's just a passing glimpse of a thing or idea or person. If you are not careful, it can lead to destruction. Buddhi nasat pranasiddhi. The mind, the intellect is destroyed and the person comes to ruin. All starts with a small, small thought or idea. That's why he says in the, in the imitation, must be watchful and resist the temptation in the beginning. Then it is easy. 
And Japan prayer are great help in that. Prayer especially. You pray to God to give strength to overcome those temptations. Temptation comes in, the, in different forms. We have to be alert and watchful and then pray. Prayer, prayer is very, very important. Prayer, and prayer is powerful also, effective also. One day somebody asked Sri Ramakrishna, does God listen to your prayers? Sri Ramakrishna said, I can, a hundred times I can say yes. If your prayer is sincere, it will be answered. God will listen to your prayer. You, and um, Ajay Pranamaraji always used to say, pray to God for strength. Yes, strength, that's all. Because we don't have to specify for what, what sort of strength you want. God knows what is what you need. God is the inner controller. He is seated in our heart. God knows what we need. So we just pray to God to give us strength. And we will be able to overcome these dangers on a spiritual path. Thank you. Thank you. Going beyond positive and negative. Going beyond positive and negative. See, we all have our likes and dislikes. Our we some things we like, something we don't like, something gives us pleasure, something gives us um unhappiness if if we like one thing that shows that we don't like something else they cannot they all always go together likes and dislikes happiness and misery they all go together we are happy for some some time we cannot be happy always after some time for some other reason we become unhappy we are happy because we are attached to some things. And then if, the, if we lose the thing or that uh, event comes to an end, we become unhappy. We like some, some person, that person goes away, we become unhappy. The presence of the person gives happiness, the person moves away, we become unhappy. So they always go together to avoid unhappiness, you have to avoid happiness also. Happiness means the uh, what to say from the external things. The real happiness is beyond both. Beyond the ordinary happiness and misery. The ordinary happiness comes, it's the other side of the coin. This uh, pairs of opposite is both together that is two, two sides of the same coin. If you have likes, you will have dislikes. If you, have, if you enjoy um, heat, heat and cold go together. You cannot avoid that. <clears throat> so that's a state where you reach when you have self-realization or God realization, you go beyond these pairs of opposites. In the Gita, Sri Krishna describes <clears throat> the characteristics of a person of steady wisdom. In the second chapter, in the 12th chapter, he gives the uh, this, uh, characteristics of a true devotee. And again, in the 14th chapter, you can see him describing the characteristics of a person who has gone beyond the three gunas. If you look at them, they are all the same. Free from attachment and aversion. Free, um, equal in pleasure and pain. Uh, happiness and misery. Likes and dislikes. Praise and blame. They are same. They have gone beyond that. 
So whatever happens, they take it, they're not disturbed by likes and dislikes, pressure and pain, uh, praise and blame, no. That's a state. A true devotee, a person of steady wisdom, a person who has gone beyond the three gunas is in, in that state where true contentment is there. No more questions. We'll listen to a guided meditation by Revere Prabhupada Jaya Paramatma.